All right, good evening. It is great to see every one of you here in the house of the Lord tonight, especially Dustin Heck. Really glad to see Dustin here this evening representing the, that team from out in the Midwest. But uh, it's good to have you here tonight, Dustin. Um, as we get started here, just a few announcements to bring your attention to. Tomorrow evening, we have a de the deacon deaconess meeting. No, we don't. I'm seeing a, a, that's not going to happen. So disregard that and the announcement in the bulletin. However, Wednesday at 6.30, we will be having Bible study. So I want to invite you out Wednesday evening, 6.30 for that. And then Saturday the 23rd, as a reminder, is Ed Haup's memorial service here at the church at 11 a.m., and so we'd love for you to, to come and celebrate Ed's life with, with Mindy and the rest of the family. And um, we'll look forward to, to celebrating God's faithfulness through Ed's life. Uh, a few that are just a little bit down the line, uh, the Secret Sister Reveal. So ladies, that's coming up Saturday, November 6th at 3 o'clock. That'll be in the Church Family Center. And then another one for our, our families, Saturday, November 20th, is, is our teen and parent retreat. And so if you've not signed up for that yet, and, and your parents have teens or, or kiddos in the youth group, I want to encourage you to take advantage of that. That'll be up at Camp Kanesataki, Saturday, November 20th, from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. The sign-up sheet is in the lobby. And so if that pertains to you, we'd love for you to, to join us for that. And then one last thing in reference to the youth group as they're looking to raise funds for their uh, upcoming summer missions trip. Um, there is a pancake sausage breakfast fundraiser Saturday, October 30th, so just a couple weeks from now, from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. in the gym. And as, as much as we'd love to have just you here, we want to encourage you to invite friends and family to come and support the youth group as they provide you breakfast and you provide the funds for them to go be the hands and feet of, of Christ. And so if we could open with a word of prayer, we'll continue our, our service together tonight. Father, as, as, we, as we come before the throne of grace in prayer, I, I think of the, the song that Susie was just playing on that piano as it, part of the prelude, and, and the last words were of that chorus were, Lord, I lift your name on high. Uh, Lord God, that's our desire here tonight through, through this time together, and uh, I thank you for the opportunity that we have to sing songs of praise, to look into the Word of God together, to, to study the Word of God together here as we continue through the Sermon on the Mount message series. And, and uh, Lord, ultimately, our, our desire as your people, uh, it, it should be, and I pray that it is, that you would be high and lifted up, uh, that you would make yourself known through us, just as we talked about the youth group being the hands and feet this summer through their missions trip. Uh, we don't have to wait until a special missions trip to do that. We have the privilege of being your mouthpiece, your hands and feet, um, now a as your kingdom citizens. And so, Lord, we, we ask you to continue to grow us that we could more, um, more readily do that uh, in this world that so desperately needs you. Uh, Lord, as we, we come together in prayer this evening, I think of those who are, are hurting and grieving, and one of the needs that was brought to my attention was in reference to um, Rodney Peters and his family um, and, and having lost his dad, Vern, just, just under a week ago, and, and then uh, just yesterday uh, having lost his, his stepfather. So both men who were instrumental in his life, and, and he was so close to uh, having lost both of them in, in the past week. And, and I ask, Lord, you'd be with Rodney and his family, uh, with the wives of these two men, that you would encourage them, lift their spirit, and Lord, our desire is that they would see the hope that there's to be had in you. And, and, Lord, I know that that's just one instance of so many who are hurting today. And, and Lord, maybe it's those who are still grieving the, the passing of a loved one. Maybe it wasn't this week, but they're still grieving the loss of that loved one, uh, that family member, that friend. And I, I pray that you'd minister to them mightily and that as your people, the church, you would use us to, to do that also. Um, Lord, as we're, we're here together this evening, I think of Darwin Eidinger and his family as, as they continue to mend from COVID. And, I think of Darwin, who's not able to work um, and on oxygen. Lord, ask that you would just continue to strengthen him and his lungs. Uh, Lord, that you would just enable that body to, to be strengthened to do what you've created it to do. And I think of his brother who's still in the hospital. And Lord, pray that you'd minister to him and, and his, his needs and, and, and bills start to pile up. That, that, Lord, you would rally those around him to, to help him in this time of need. And that, Lord, so many others who have asked us to pray for them, 
Uh, Lord, we lift them before the throne of grace. And as, as we get the chance to study the word, we think of those kiddos in Pioneer Club. Father, we're excited that they get to, to hear the word of God, to study your word. And, and Lord, to begin to see that foundation built in their hearts and lives. And our desire is if they don't already know you, that they would come to the point uh, of coming to realize their need for a savior, their need for you. And uh, that, Lord, they would trust you. And for our teenagers, Lord, as they're in youth group, uh, I thank you, Lord, that is, as much as the, the enemy is hurling so many darts toward them, uh, Lord, I thank you for the shield of faith, and, and I thank you for the sword of the Spirit, uh, that, Lord, as they're studying and as they're uh, learning together, they're being equipped with. And, and I pray, Lord, that you would just open their hearts and their minds to your truth that not only has set them free if they know you as Savior, but will continue to set them free from the chains of sin that they might wrestle with in their lives. And, and so, Lord, we commit our services together, whether it's in the nursery, the gymnasium, the Sunday school wing, or right here in the sanctuary. We ask that you be honored and glorified and that we would be edified in Jesus' name. Amen. As we turn to the Word of God here uh, this evening, I want to I read uh, Psalm 96. And, and in that psalm, we, we hear these words. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Proclaim good tidings of his salvation from day to day. Tell of his glory among the nations, his wonderful deeds among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe or give to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in holy attire. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Indeed, the world is firmly established. It will not be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar in all it contains. Let the field exalt in all that is in it. Then all the trees of the forest will sing for joy before the Lord, for he is coming. For he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. As we listen to that psalm, we have been called to worship him together through the fruit of of our voices, which prayerfully is the overflow of our hearts. And, and I assure you, our God is worthy of worship today. So let's sing together, worthy of worship. The words will be on the screen. Savior. 
everyone said. Amen, indeed. As we continue in, in worship, as we turn into the Word of God, it turn into, we, won't, we can't turn in to the Word of God. That would be like transformational, right? But as we turn in the Word of God, the James chapter 5, 19 and 20, and this will lead us into, partially lead us into our sermon here tonight. And James told the early church, the early believers, he says, My brethren, if any among you strays from the truth and one turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. And you know, you're going to see here tonight as we continue in the Sermon on the Mount and, and Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, the first words in that, and you'll, and you'll see this in a little bit, are judge not. And, and that is a, and I'll, and I'll share this again, but that is a passage of Scripture that is grossly uh, misused and abused um, and, and, and used as a, a reasoning for us to never come alongside of each other. Don't judge me. Don't judge me. The Bible says that. In context, it does, but we need to look at it in context. Uh, there are times when we come alongside of each other, and what's really uh, incredible here is that James tells the church, and you know what? There was a time when James, the half-brother of Jesus, this fit him. He was a sinner, and that word sinner in the Greek is in reference to an unbeliever. And so there's somebody, maybe they're kind of like alongside of the truth, and they've maybe walked along with us, but then they turn away. And what does James say to us uh, from someone who's, who turns and strays from the truth, and one of us turn him back? It says, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. As, as we get ready to sing our next hymn, I believe that's hymn number 515, God has called us as his, his instruments of righteousness. And it's God in us that does this. Uh, he's called us as we share the gospel to see the perishing rescued. And so let's keep that in mind as we sing together 515, Rescue the Perishing. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin and the grave. We for the erring one, lift up the fallen, tell them of Jesus the mighty to save. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Though they are sliding him, still he is waiting, waiting the penitent child to receive. Plead with them earnestly, plead with them gently. He will forgive if they only believe. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Down in the human heart, crushed by the tempter, feelings lie buried that grace can restore. Touched by a loving heart, wakened by kindness, Chords that are broken will vibrate once more. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Rescue the perishing, duty demands it. Strength for your labor the Lord will provide. Back to the narrow way, patiently win them. Tell the poor wanderer a Savior has died. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. And everyone said, Amen. We can be grateful that God is one who rescues the perishing and, and saves the, the repentant sinner. And you know what? As we shared this morning, there is a purpose. There is a purpose for our lives. God has called us uh, not only to enjoy the, the gifts and the benefits that come by being aligned with him, 
but, but never to forget the, the calling he's placed on our lives, and that is to, as we respond in obedience to his word, to advance the gospel, uh, to be people as kingdom citizens that would advance those kingdom perspectives. And, and you know what? Is it possible that we could lose that flair? Absolutely. Is it possible we could lose that focus? Absolutely. And everything that Satan has in this world system is, is, is bent, gung-ho bent, on making sure you and I's eyes and our hearts get distracted from the purpose and the calling that God has in our lives. And, and you know what we need when that happens is a reviving. And if we want to see a revival in this land, it's going to start with a revival in the hearts of God's people. And so let's sing together hymn number 20, Revive Us Again. We praise Thee, O God, for the Son of Thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, Thine the glory, hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, Thine the glory, revive us again. Let's stand as we sing that together. We praise Thee, O God, for Thy Spirit of light, who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Hallelujah, Amen. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain, who has borne all our sins and has cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Hallelujah, Amen. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Revive us again. Revive us again. Fill each heart with Thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Hallelujah, Amen. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Revive us again. Amen. Great seeing you. May be seated as we continue uh, into the message here this evening and. If you'd like to join along, you can turn to Matthew chapter 7, and we'll be starting in verse 1. And if by chance you did not bring your copy of the sword with you tonight, uh, no problem. Turn in the Pew Bible to page 675, and you'll be right there to follow along with us uh, for those main texts. And um, as, I, as I shared with you in, in the, the title of the sermon, you can see it's to judge or not to judge. <laughs> that is the question. And uh, we have an answer for that tonight. And actually, the next couple of Sunday evenings, we're going we're gonna to talk about that. But as we begin our lesson this evening, we are going to be discussing a, a passage, and specifically a verse, and specifically two words at the beginning, uh, that, are, that is commonly quoted and just as frequently misapplied and interpreted. And, and it's in reference to judging. Um, particularly, as we talk about judging tonight, it's going to be uh, a contrast between uh, judging that stems from hypocrisy and self-righteousness, um, judging that, is, that stems from one looking to elevate themselves at the expense of somebody else versus genuine, true spiritual discernment. And when we respond in obedience to the Word of God, we are called to come alongside of one another when we're living in error, uh, when we are, are struggling in sin and in, in the, in the muck and the mire of sin. We are called to come alongside of one another. And, and I want to share a paragraph here with you that, that I, had, I, well, I, I actually, at the beginning of the service, was going to pull this out. But, you know, I, I wrote this more for myself as I studied this this week. Um, because before I come alongside of someone else, in fact, Jesus will make that clear in just a little bit. And make no mistake, we are called to come alongside of one another. And, and if I want to be well-received, then, then I need to make sure that I'm doing some introspection as well, allowing God to deal with my life, to work in my heart, and to deal with my brokenness and my sin. And, and you know, as we, as we get to Matthew 7, in, in chapters 5 and 6, Jesus really has been laying the groundwork for what needs to take place, what the, the right attitude of heart will look like for those who can 
accurately and adequately do the very thing that Jesus is going to call them to do. And, and so as, as we be, go through the message here tonight, and we talk about judging, um, this again was a challenge to me, but I'll share this with you tonight as well. As we keep in mind how Jesus began the Sermon on the Mount, um, he, gave his ins- he gave his listeners insight repeatedly as to the characteristics of kingdom citizens. We call them the Beatitudes. Um, as he began the Sermon on the Mount, he started with the Beatitudes. And I'm not going to just reread those, but just some notes here that I fleshed out. And, and as we, we think about those who would align themselves with Christ, be in relationship with Christ, those that Christ described as kingdom citizens, um, rightfully saw themselves in light of who God is. Number one, like, blessed are the poor in spirit. They, they saw themselves in light of who God is, is holy, righteous, and just. Uh, he's the one who's, the, who's sending his son as the king of his kingdom. What he says goes. Uh, he, again, he's sovereign, he's in control, and all the while is he's all these things. They're sinful, self-centered, and depraved people that, that actually are longing to be in a kingdom that, as Jesus is speaking, they're realizing very quickly they cannot be a part of given their current situation. And, and he would further go on a, a, to share with them, and they would learn that the relationship between the Lord God and his kingdom subjects would be characterized by citizens who don't gloat over sin, don't gloss over sin, don't justify sin. Listen, and why do I say that? Because if we're just genuine here this evening, and we're going to talk about a passage that, 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 that really probably hits all of us in some way. Listen, we've got like supersonic bat radar when it comes to sin in other people's lives. And we are quick, and I can tell you, because I've sat on my side of the desk listening to people who are struggling with absolute brokenness, horrendous brokenness, and in the midst of that, they're, they're pointing out the flaws in others. I'm like, and yet we're here because. Those that Christ is talking about, that, 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 and we will become more characterized by this. We won't gloss over, we won't gloat over, we won't justify, we won't excuse. But in a very biblical and Christ-like way, we will start to actually grieve over our sin because we're sinning against a holy and righteous God. And especially as we celebrated communion, we realize what Christ did on our behalf to born us into his kingdom to start with. We realize that that sin, that brokenness, the wrath that he faced, that was all ours. We deserve to experience that. And so a right way for us to respond would be to grieve over our sin. And as we grieve over our sin, we demonstrate a humble spirit toward God and, and, and I love that when it's talked about the meek, blessed are the meek, because the meek are those who are like, they understand who God is. They understand who they are. They grieve over the brokenness of their sin. And they're like, you know what, God, here is the blank check of my life. Use it in any way that you would see fit. And so the child of God that is, that is meek, that kingdom citizen, understanding what God has done on their behalf is like, here, take my life. We sing that hymn, take my life and let it be. And, and, and let it be consecrated to you. And, and so they want him to use it in any way that he sees fit because they understand uh, that, that God and his righteousness, he's been good to them. God and his mercy and his faithfulness, he's been good to them. And you know what? They start to hunger more and more for, for God and his righteousness. They hunger and they thirst for more and more of that. And Christ's likeness has become their greatest pursuit. Continually growing in our understanding of God's mercy toward us, we begin to extend mercy more and more toward the people in our lives. And, 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 you know, when we lose sight of our own sinfulness and God's grace toward us as sinners, when we lose sight of that, we will lose the ability, we will become much more diminished in our ability to show mercy and grace toward the people who hurt us, who offend us, who who, who go against us uh, or hurt us. And so we begin to extend mercy more and more as we consider the mercy God has shown us. And, and, and it says, blessed are the pure in heart. And as God does that work, that refining, sanctifying work through his word and the power of the Holy Spirit, you know, the purity of heart that we now have in Christ begins to be fleshed out through the fruit of our lives. And you know what, all the while is, and, and one of the other things, I almost forgot this one, are the peacekeepers. Blessed are the peacemakers. You know, as we, we consider that we now have peace with God through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and what we deserve is wrath, we become people who are characterized by that, that quality as well, that rather than looking to cause this unity, you know, we're looking to bring peace among the ranks within the body of Christ. And, and as we're doing that, we're all the while swimming against the tide of culture and the sinful world around us. 
And when we do that, that leaves us wide open to the persecution that put Christ on the cross, the persecution that saw every one of his disciples martyred, and the persecution that sees us getting hammered by the world as we live for God's honor and glory and in obedience to his word. But yet, as we do that, nonetheless, we become uh, more and more the salt and light that he's called us to be. And, and you know what? As I, as I think about that, I need to not forget that, that that's what a kingdom citizen looks like and, and the areas where I'm deficient in that before I come alongside of someone else. But make no mistake, we are called to come alongside of each other. We want to do it in a godly, biblical way. And, and so throughout this series, and, and tonight's no different, we've seen a contrast between those who live their lives according to the word of God as kingdom citizens and those who live their lives governed by the desire to serve themselves, and unfortunately, even the religious leaders, it was in the name of God, but it was for themselves. So to judge or not to judge? Well, we're going to look at Matthew 7, 1 through, 1 through 5, really, tonight. But I want Nelson to, or Jeremy to pull up a picture here. Because how the people in our world read the Bible today, judge not. Don't you judge me. Don't you judge me, you hypocrite. You sin just like I do. The Bible says don't you judge or you'll be judged. So you can't tell me that what I'm doing is wrong. You can't come alongside me. You have no right. Well, listen, if I read the Bible the way the world does and all I did was circle what I wanted to and scribble out the rest of the word of God and take it out of context, I could go along with that. But we're not going to do that tonight. We're going to look at, starting tonight, what it looks like to be able to come alongside of one another and why we don't find ourselves being judgmental towards the, the broken in our lives. And so let's, let's read Matthew 7, starting in verse 1. Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet or measure out, it should be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote or the splinter that's in your brother's eye, but consider us not the beam or the plank that's in your own eye. Or how will you say to your brother, let me pull out the moat out of your eye, and behold, a beam is in your own eye. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly the cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye. In verse 6, we'll look at this uh, in, in a time down the line here. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs. Neither cast you your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. Let, let's go to a prayer before we go into the sermon here tonight. Father, we, we, we come to you and, and we thank you for this, this opportunity to study the word of God together, your word. And, and Lord, I do thank you for the, for the body and the bride of Christ, the church, that you have called out. You've called us out together uh, that, Lord, we could bring honor and glory to your great name, and that, Lord, we could edify, build up one another a as your people. And, and, Lord, part of that is it's absolutely coming alongside of one another. We talked about that in membership class. We talk about that in our own church covenant, that, that we're going to come alongside of one another. And that includes not just in the good times, the fun times of fellowship, but, Lord, when we're living in brokenness and living in sin, and that becomes apparent. Lord, we are called to come alongside and to restore, to repair, to refresh one another. And, and yet, Lord, we want to do that in a right way. Uh, we don't want to be pharisaical in, in, in our coming alongside of each other where we're just looking to tear each other down to elevate ourselves. Lord, we, we want to use biblical discernment and be genuine and gentle in our restoration that, that, Lord, we could see that brother or sister because one day it might be us that's on the other end of this but to see them restored in, in line with your word and in step with, with you as they live by your spirit. And so, Lord, give us wisdom tonight as we study the word. Give us clarity as I share and as we listen, and, and that, Lord, we would readily receive the instruction of your word, uh, that we could more, um, more appropriately, more efficiently, more effectively be the salt and light this world needs as we live for your glory and praise. In Jesus' name. Amen. So as we see here tonight, point one, and we're only going to get the two sub points here. I'm not going to keep you over time uh, tonight. Um, I did that this morning. You're welcome. And so I will be a little more gracious here uh, this evening. But the, the first point we're going to delve into here tonight is that kingdom citizens are cautioned about being judgmental toward others. It's not that we're not to judge and we're not to discern rightly right and wrong, but we are not to be judged mental in our spirit toward others. And so in Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, it says, Judge not that you be not judged. 
Now, we know that Jesus has addressed the behavior of those that were in the circle around him throughout chapters 5 and 6 to this point. And I can tell you as we get to verses 5 and 6, he's looking to these people as they do it in a right way to also do that same thing. So the issue is not do we come alongside of each other. The issue at hand tonight is how do we do that and how do we make sure we do it in a right way. Um, it's not that we don't have the, the ability to say, well, this is right versus this is wrong. It's not that we can't lovingly come alongside that brother or sister who's struggling in the muck and mire of sin and bring that to their attention. I shared this with our membership class. If, if walking through the church, they hear me say something egregiously calloused or wrong to my wife, I would hope that you love me enough to pull me inside and say, Pastor Scott, did I really just hear you talk to Melissa in that manner? Did you really just say that? To your bride. Now, number one, I really hope I don't ever do that, not only in the house of the Lord, and I'm far from perfect. None of us are spouses in this room. But I'd hope I'd have the humility and the honesty to be like, yeah, yeah, I did. And thank you for calling me on that. We are called to do that. What we're not called to do is to deliberately, vehemently, aggressively, and egregiously rip down someone else for the sole purpose of elevating ourselves, making ourselves look better, putting them under so that we can be up. That is what Jesus is addressing as he speaks to this crowd. And it's appropriately, appropriate that he does so. And I say that because we have spent a long time in the Sermon on the Mount, and we have seen repeatedly, and it's not just the religious leaders. Now, Jesus addresses them the hardest. But there were those in that crowd who had learned from the religious leaders. And so as, as they have been challenged in reference to not elevating themselves at the expense of others, uh, they've also been challenged in regards to their motive behind their, their giving. Why are, why are you giving? Uh, are you giving and, and throwing the coins in the plate as loud as you can just so others can be like, ooh, look at how much they give. And remember, Jesus said they had the reward. Why did they do their good deeds? It was to make themselves look better, that they may be seen of men. Remember those words? We don't ever want to do that which we do, that we may be seen of men. Because at that moment, you have your full reward, and it's simply the applause, the empty applause of man, and we lose the reward that God would give us as his children. Their prayers, even their prayers, I mean, and it's not that maybe they didn't say some right things, but the motivation behind their prayers was simply just so people could be like, ooh, look at how awesomely articulate their prayer is. And, and I can tell you, I've been in Bible college, and even now, like people will be like, oh, look at how articulate they were. And yet I find these same great men of faith, their wives hated them. You, you say, Pastor Scott's a little harsh. No, it's accurate. They had articulate, verbose vocabularies, but they didn't love their wives as Christ loved the church. What good does it do to say all these big words and, 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 and to sound that way to make yourself known when the fruit behind it is, is lacking? They're fasting. Like they actually would deprive themselves of food, drink, even sexual pleasure. And why? So that people could look at them and say, look at what they're doing. And really it was their everything. Everything they did in their lives, if they were to check their motives, they would see that it was to lift themselves at the expense of others. And, and this is the scary part. In the name of God. Just let that set for a second. These were men who had given themselves, those that were the, the teacher. Remember what Jesus called them? They were like a, a pit of vipers, whitewashed tombs. Like th that was not a good thing. They were of their father, the devil. These were men who knew the word of God better than anyone else in that crowd next to Jesus. And yet, and yet it was, it was in the name of God, but it was for their own glory. And so as we go tonight, as we look at this, kingdom citizens cautioned about being judgmental toward others. Uh, Daniel Aiken, in his commentary on this, this sermon, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, highlighted three negative aspects of a judgmental spirit. So I borrowed his three aspects, fleshed them out myself, but I want to give Daniel Aiken the credit that he's due. And, and the first thing that he said about why you and I should be cautioned about being judgmental toward others is, number one, it's foolish. It's foolish as we consider the word that God has shared to this point. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 1 to 2, it says, Judge not that you be not judged. 
For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. As as I share those words, I mean, it should almost resonate as you go back to chapter 6, the truth that Jesus has already shared with them. The way you and I relate to and respond to others, it matters to God. It It matters greatly. And he's already challenged them in regards to the way they would, they would respond to the other people in their lives in light of how God has responded to them. If you turn back to Matthew chapter 6 and verse 12, during the pattern of prayer that Jesus shared with them. In verse 12, it says this, and forgive us our debts. So it's asking God to wipe clean our slate as we forgive our debtors. And so it's like, God, will you wipe my slate clean as, as I do the same for others? And that construct, it's with the understanding that you and I are going to do that. And so it's like, God, I want you to forgive my debt, but I'm going to do that in the lives of others too, those that offend against me. And then verses 14 to 15, we read these words, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespass. And I want, I want to clarify, we talked about this in that message. This isn't in regards to salvation. Now, this is in regards to the, the intimacy of fellowship that you and I would have with the Lord our God. I mean, if you're in Christ today, you are in Christ. But is it possible to be in Christ and to have a fellowship that's broken? Yes, it is. Because if you're in a marital relationship right now and you mistreat your spouse, how intimate is your fellowship? It's lacking. Uh, Think about that with your own children. You can have a relationship, a bond with a son or a daughter, and and it's binding. it, It is what it is, but can that bond be broken? Can that intimacy, that fellowship be broken? Absolutely. What does it take for it to be restored? Number one, it's repentance. Whatever there is going on between us that's led to that brokenness, there needs to be repentance to see that relationship restored. There needs to be a turning away with that repentance from the behavior that caused that brokenness in, at the first. And, and, and so what Jesus is saying is, listen, if you want to have intimate fellowship with me, then you need to be willing to forgive and, and to see healing in the relationship with others. If you and I are unwilling to relent in, in our bitterness and our hurt and our anger, and, and stubbornly we rebel against God's word in the way we treat others, Jesus is like, listen, if you're not willing to be repentant and to respond in an appropriate way toward the people that offend you, you will not have the fellowship with me that you desire and that he desires for us. And so in a similar way, Jesus is like, listen, if you're gonna judge others, just know that the judgment that you meet out toward others is the judgment that will be meted back out to you. And, and for you and I as Christ followers, we should not want that to be the case. In James chapter 4, verse 6, and, and I appreciate what James says here in reference to the egregious nature of our sin. And listen to what the Word of God says, but he gives a greater grace. And, um, and I think that the King James says that he giveth more grace. Grace that's greater than our sin. You know, the truth is what we desire from God is not grace, it's not mercy, it's not restoration, it's judgment. But thank God that Jesus took that upon himself. And God gives us greater grace, grace that's greater than our sin. But listen to the response that you and I, the hearts that you and I should have in light of that gift of grace. It says, therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud. Who are the proud? If you were to look that up, it's those who make themselves more than what they really are, those who make themselves more than the people around them. And God's word says that he is opposed to those who puff themselves up. But listen to what the word of God says, but God gives grace to the humble. And we again see this contrast between those who elevate themselves and that's as high as they're going to get because they've already given themselves the raise versus the lowly, and it goes back to those who are poor in spirit, those who mourn, those who are meek, those who understand who they are in light of the magnitude of what Christ has done. These are those, the humble, who are of a low estate, a low degree. And why are they so? Because God has shown them a grace that's greater than all of their sin. And so as we consider being judgmental towards others, it's foolish because as we think about what God has shown to us and what we desire for him to continue to show to us, he calls us to do the same. You know, I want to share a statement here that that I highlighted from from my notes. Again, this was from my own uh, time in prayer here this week. But it causes me to, to check my motives. 
And I wrote here that God is the one who judges and pours out his condemnation upon the unrepentant sinner, not me. It's God who is in the place of judging the unrepentant. It's God who is in the place of judging for eternity the sin of the broken, not me. I have never been called to take that place. But what am I called to do? Because this really does challenge my motives, why I'm doing, why I'm saying, why I'm going the direction I'm going. While he's the one who is called to judge and to condemn unrepentant sinners, we are called to come alongside of others and to rescue, and it's really God through us, as we have the opportunities, those who are struggling. And so God has never called us to put ourselves on some soapbox or on some kind of pillar and look down and and judgmentally slam those who are in our lives. And yet I can tell you that that is one of the easiest things that we can find ourselves doing is we consider the broken who, and there's not one of us in this room who can't probably immediately think of someone who is struggling with sin. Someone who has caused us harm. Someone who is causing us harm, causing us pain. Someone who is causing brokenness in their family. And maybe our immediate response isn't what Christ has shown toward us. It's the want to drop the hammer. And yet, what does God tell us in his word in reference to those who are broken in our lives? In Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, it says, Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, any. And that word trespass means unintentional error or a willful transgression. So that means there's a brother or sister in Christ Maybe they've unintentionally harmed us, or maybe it's a willful transgression. But there's someone who is caught up in this. It says, you who are spiritual, not superior, those who are spiritual, who are mature. It says, restore, and that means to repair or adjust. We are called to come alongside of them and to see repair work done in their lives, to see an adjustment to the direction they're going. It says, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Why are we coming alongside of them? Why are we coming with a spirit of gentleness? Because God has been gentle with us. God has been good to us. It says, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. And so it's foolish as we consider what God has done for us to not then do the same for others. But the second thing we're going to see here this evening is it's, it's prideful. Being judgmental towards the people in our lives, it's, it's prideful. And, and as we, we delve into that here a little bit, there's a lady in an airport who bought a book to read as she waited for the flight to take off and a package of cookies to eat while she waited. After she had taken her seat in the terminal and had gotten engrossed in her book, she noticed that the man one seat away from her was fumbling to open the package of cookies on the seat between them. She was absolutely flabbergasted and shocked that a stranger would eat her cookies that she didn't really know what to do. So she just reached over and took one of the cookies and ate it too. Well, the man didn't say anything, but he soon reached over and he took another one of the cookies. Well, the woman wasn't going to let him sit there and eat all of her cookies, and so she took another one. When they were down to one cookie remaining, the man reached over, broke the cookie in half, ate ate the one half, left the other, and got up and and walked away. The lady could not believe this man's nerve, his audacity, but soon the announcement came for her to get up and board her plane. Well, once the woman was on board her plane, she had a little bit of time to think. She's still angry. It dawned on her um, as she reached into her purse for a tissue that she probably really shouldn't judge people too harshly because as she moved the tissue there in her purse was the unopened package of cookies. And as I read that, you know, as, as I thought about it, like you, you think about it, it's prideful for us to be judgmental towards others. And so judgmental means looking to tear others down uh, and, and, and looking to elevate ourselves. It's, it, it's prideful for us to do that. And I think of this lady that she didn't have a clear view to judge the situation. Now, number one, she was distracted by the book that she's reading. And it, it probably was a really good book that she got engrossed in. And she looks over and just naturally assumes that, you know, she bought the cookies and maybe this guy, maybe he would have bought his own cookies too. She didn't think that way. But she reacted based on what she thought, based on a misconception and not on the truth of the matter. And the truth is, he wasn't wrong. She was. 
And until she dealt with her own misconceptions and errors, she was not in a place to deal with this man and his supposed indiscretion as well. Well, that's a silly illustration. In a similar way, we as sinners, it's just as silly when we try to address the brokenness in the lives of other people, but all the while we're blind, blind, yeah, blind, blind and unresponsive. I did not mean to say that. I do not make blonde jokes. Are blind and unresponsive to the sin in our lives. So in a very serious way, is Jesus, and listen, it's not as laid back, I'm certain, in this circle as it is tonight. Maybe as we're hearing this, and to a degree, it probably does prick each of our hearts. And, and I hope if it's not now, that when the opportunity arises for you to catch yourself being judgmental toward others, you'll think about this word. Or when you think about being able to come alongside of one another, that, that you'll consider your own indiscretions first to put yourself in a right way. But as Jesus said this to those people, it was, I'm certain, very uncomfortable. And there were some people that were very angry with what he was saying. And listen in verses 3 and 4 what Jesus says. He says, why beholdest? That EST in the King James, that's like an ongoing action verb. Why do you continue to behold? It's not that you just notice. You continue to focus your eyes. You've got your attention. It is like solely zoned in on the brokenness in the lives of others. And why beholdest thou the moat, the splinter? It's like the smallest speck. You're looking to tear this person down for the smallest chink in their armor that's in your brother's eye, but considerest, E-S-T. You continually, constantly refuse to acknowledge the beam that's in your own eye. That's a pretty powerful word that Jesus says. Why are you constantly, as he's sharing this with this crowd of people standing around him, why are you constantly looking at the splinter and that guy's eye and you've got a tube of 12 plank sticking out of yours? In verse 4, he says, or, or how will you say to your brother, let me pull out the splinter from your own eye and behold, a beam is in yours. Number one, I want to know how you can see well enough to pull a splinter out when you've got a plank blocking you. And that's exactly what Jesus is trying to say to them. And so it's pretty ridiculous when you, when you think about that. Why would I have the audacity to come to you to tear you down? And I've got this like egregious indiscretion going on right here. And I'm refusing to deal with it. And that's the second question that we find in verse 4. How do I have the nerve to, to look to you and to address the sin in your life and hold you accountable, but not be held accountable to my own sin. Well, Sinclair Ferguson said it very well in reference to this prideful, plank-eyed individual. And this is where we want to be careful this, that this doesn't describe you and I. He says, so deeply has his own sin conquered him that he has become blind to it. Incredibly, it says, sensitive to the sin in others, he has been desensitized to the sin in his own heart. As I read that quote this, this past week, and, and actually it was last week when I was out with, with uh, my sinus infection. As I read that quote, my mind immediately went to an Old Testament example where there was a man who was guilty of adultery. There was a man who was guilty of trying to cover that adultery up. There was a man who was guilty of planning and executing murder. There was a man who was guilty of trying to cover that up for next to a year. And yet when somebody with a lesser indiscretion was brought before him, this hypothetical situation, this same man who was guilty of all these things is driven to anger and rage and pronounces that death should be the result of this lesser indiscretion. And that man was King David. David was not willing to deal with the plank sticking out of his eye, but he's moved and motivated to this genuine anger towards a lesser indiscretion. And so we want to be, and, and we're going to get to this next week, but as we, get, as we consider the God-given role, and it is God-given, you know, if I'm broken, listen, don't let me in a pool of my brokenness. And if you're broken, I shouldn't gloat over that. If you're stuck in sin, I should care enough and love you enough. And really, it's because I love God enough that I come alongside of you with a spirit of gentleness and humility, willing to roll my sleeves up and get dirty with you 
to see you restored in your walk with Christ in the body and the bride of Christ. But as we consider the role that God has given us, and we're going to talk about that next time, in light of King David, it would behoove us to follow the counsel that David gave in reference to God searching our own hearts and dealing with our own sin prior to doing so. In Psalm 139, verses 23 to 24, and, and you know, as we, as we leave this place tonight, and may, hey, maybe this is a verse that we can look at through the course of this week. Uh, and especially if you're dealing with brokenness or, or if you, there's a, a confrontation needs to take place, this would be a good place to start for you and for me. Uh, this would be a great text for us to look at. As we consider the, God's desire to use us as tools of righteousness, we need to first be willing to look at our own hearts and lives. And, and David said this, search me, O God, and know my heart. That word search means to penetrate deeply, to examine intimately. He's like, God, I want you to get to the the plank that's hanging out of my eye, which really is a fruit of my heart. I want you to search me and know my heart. I I want you to know my motives. I, I want you to test why it is. In fact, he goes on to say, try me and know my anxious thought. That means to test and to investigate. So it's allowing God to call us for, to the carpet for the brokenness in our lives. In verse 24, and see if there be any hurtful way in me. You know, know, one of the things, and I I shared this before, and I I will certainly share it again, and I'll probably repeat it next Sunday if we get the chance. You know, God has called us, and if you read in Ephesians chapter 4, it says, speaking the truth in love. We're to come alongside of each other. And and as we consider this, see if there be any hurtful way in me. If if what I'm going to say to you, and, and I've been guilty of this, and maybe each of us have been, and maybe this will be a gut check for the next time it comes around. But if what I'm going to say to you in confrontation is, number one, not out of love for God first, which that would motivate me to come alongside of you, but if it's not out of love for God and then a love for you, I probably should keep my mouth shut. If what you're about to say, and I don't mean about someone, we need to nix that too. But when I look to confront something that I'm aware of, it's not like, hey, do you know so-and-so? No, it's when I go to so-and-so. If what I'm saying isn't out of love for God and out of love for that person, then I shouldn't. But as I go to God and as we echo these words, search me, O God, know my heart, try me, and know my anxious thoughts, and see if there be any hurtful way in me. I want to make sure that what I'm doing is in line with who God would have me to be. And it says, and lead me in the way everlasting. And when we're walking in the way everlasting, God's way, he's directing our steps. He puts us in the appropriate place that we can be in the lives of others who God has called us to be. As we close here, we're going to sing tonight a church arise in closing. Can, can we bow our heads in a, for a word of prayer here? Father, as we, we consider the, the words that Jesus shared in, in the Sermon on the Mount, specifically in reference to Matthew chapter 7 and, and, and verses 1 through 4 that we've looked at this evening, um, Lord, we, we readily admit to you that, like the woman on that plane, we, we, don't, always, we don't always have the, the full story. Um, we, we don't always respond with all the facts. And, and the truth is we, we have our own misconceptions, our own brokenness to deal with that, that kind of shade our ability to, to, to say and do the right things in the first place. And, and Lord, I, I pray that as, as David, and, and he knew full well what that looks like to, to deal with a lesser sin in the life of someone else, but to be totally unwilling uh, to deal with the brokenness in his own life, a much more egregious sin. And, and Lord God, I, I thank you that your desire is that we would come alongside of each other. Lord, that the believers in this room, you, you have called us out together. That's what church ecclesia It's the called out ones. We've been called out together. And and Lord, those who are mature, we are to come alongside of each other. When a brother or sister is stumbling in the brokenness of sin, we're not to just, it's kind of like I shared with my class this morning. When you hear about a woman who's being ravaged and and, and raped and beaten on a a subway or on a a train and an entire car of people just turn the blind eye to it, that's egregious to us. How in the world could anyone lose the ability to respond to be so insensitive? And in a like way, 
in the body and bride of Christ, you have not called us to turn a blind eye to brokenness, and you've not called us to turn a blind eye to sin and to justify it or minimize it in any way. But you've also not caused us, called us to capitalize on the brokenness of a brother to exalt ourselves. You, you have called us by, by the same grace that you've meted out toward us, the same gentleness that you've dealt with us as sinners to come alongside of the broken in our own lives. And Lord, everyone in this room, we're going to have opportunities this week uh, to either not address, to not say anything because we're not saying it out of a right spirit, not out of love for you and a love for them. But Lord, there will be opportunities when maybe we can come alongside of others. But before we do, Lord, as David shared in Psalm 139, I pray that you would start that work in us. That we'd heed the words of Jesus to not allow those planks in our eyes and those sins that, Lord, maybe we've ignored to be left unchecked. But Lord, we'd let you graciously and rightfully deal with those so that, Lord, we would be in a position that, that you could use us as instruments of grace in the lives of others. Lord, if we're in the midst of a situation, where maybe right now we're struggling or we're failing in this area, Lord, I ask that you would forgive us and that, Lord, we seek repentance for the ways that we've been responding or maybe we are responding right now. And, Lord, I pray that you would restore us and that, Lord, that this situation could be reconciled and could be redeemed in such a way that we could be used in the lives of others and that we could be that brother or sister in Christ that rightly comes alongside of the broken in our own lives. Uh, and so, Lord, I pray that as your people, the church, that we'd have a desire to, to live life your way, to respond your way, and for the world to see you in us. And so, Lord, as we sing this last song, O Church, Arise, um, Lord, I do pray that we would look to you as our, our source uh, of strength for all that you call us to do and our perfect example as to how to do it. Um, Lord, I thank you for the ways that you've been gracious to us in our failures, uh, the ways that you've been merciful when, Lord, we would have smoked ourselves by now for the ways that we've behaved. And so, Lord, let us keep that in mind as we go throughout the course of this week. And as Jesus called that crowd to be markedly different, Lord, may we be so as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue in our service as we close with Chorus 262, O Church, Arise. I think it's fitting that we would stand and sing this together. O church, arise and put your armor on. Hear the call of Christ our captain. For now the weak can say that they are strong in the strength that God has given. With shield of faith and belt of truth, we'll stand against the devil's lies. An army bold whose battle cry is love, reaching out to those in darkness. Our call to war, to love the captive soul, but to rage against the captor. And with the sword that makes the wounded whole, we will fight with faith and valor. When faced with trials on every side, we know the outcome is secure. And Christ will have the prize for which he died, an inheritance of nations. Come see the cross where love and mercy meet as the Son of God is stricken. Then see his foes lie crushed beneath his feet, for the conqueror has risen. And as the stone is rolled away, and Christ emerges from the grave, this victory march continues till the day, 
every eye and heart shall see him so spirit come put strength in every stride give grace for every hurdle that we may run with faith to win the prize of a servant good and faithful as saints of old still line the way retelling triumphs of his grace we hear their calls and hunger for the day when with christ we stand in glory father as we close out this service in prayer tonight i think of the the, the words to the song we just sang is saints of old still line the way retelling triumphs of his grace lord i think of hebrews chapter 12 and it says that we've been compassed about by such a great cloud of witnesses lord i am so thankful for those in our lives that lord have been faithful for those, Lord, that maybe they didn't start out that way, but Lord, as you grew them, as they came to a, a, a greater knowledge of your word and through the spirit of God has applied to their lives, their lives are radically transformed and you use them to draw us to yourself. Lord, I thank you for the examples of grace and of mercy and the forgiveness that they've been to us. And Lord, in so doing, they've taught us the need for us to do the same. And Lord, I pray that maybe one day as others sing this song, they might think of us in that number. Is those who have responded in a right way to your mercy, to your grace, and Lord, in so doing, have lived in such a way that others could see us as those cheerleaders along the side, showing them what that right godly living looks like. And so, Lord, I pray that for us this week, as we've heard this challenge this evening from your word, that, Lord, you, you would allow us to, to humble ourselves in such a way to do that introspection in our own hearts and lives, to let you deal with the planks in our lives so that we, with the right heart, with the right attitude, in the right way, lovingly, with gentleness and humility, could come alongside of the broken that you place as opportunities for ministry for us, that, Lord, we could see them restored. Lord, thank you for those in this room. I pray you give them a, a great and godly rest of their day. Give them a wonderful night's rest, that they wake up refreshed, ready to do your kingdom work in the morning. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. The Lord bless you. Have a great week ahead.